Next to the last talk. Obviously, we're here to London. It's not here for you as much as it will be when I talk this week. Now, now. Now, now. Jonah uh, Edson is a science educator from the Smithsonian Institution in the Haas Territory, adjacent to the main Smithsonian Aerospace on the Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a very eclectic background in medical geology, established in the West Coast, uh, trained in geology, mm -hmm. in geology, and mm -hmm. environmental science, and uh, very much interested in space, and is a teacher in space, and interested in building space, and space art, and the liberal arts and space and science together. So she's got a very interesting job. Do you know Mr. Jupiter? <laughs> Thank you, Alan. That was very kind. Yeah, so this is my first time at Almost Heaven. Um, I'm having an absolute blast. <laughs> um, and yeah, like I said, I have, I have a pretty wonky background. Um, I'm a preschool dropout. Not even kidding. That was the first line of my college application essay. Um, I unschooled until I went to college. I did geology and then realized that environmental consulting was soul-wrenchingly repetitive and boring, and that volunteering at the Natural History Museum was real fun. Figured maybe I should get paid to do that. So it turns out there are Master of Arts in Teaching and Museum Education programs. And I went to the one in DC, and then Air and Space had gotten a grant for an astronomy program, and they hired me. <laughs> so four years in, it is still an epically fun job. <laughs> um, everything from, oh, hey, that was an astronaut, to, you know, walking under Amelia Earhart's plane every time I go to my office. So it, it's pretty cool. Um, and the observatory, I'll talk about it in a second, but yeah, it's right on the mall, um, inspired by International Year of Astronomy, wanting to put telescopes where the people are. So the main thing I do is run the observatory. Um, I'm obviously not on the Juno mission, <laughs> not part of NASA. I am not connected to the team for Juno at all, but I'm super excited about it. And I had offered uh, to these guys to be able to, to kind of give an update on it because it's a very right now mission. Um, also, I was an unschooler. I don't teach in a classroom for a reason. You do not need to raise your hands. Um, I'm a big believer in education being dialogue. Um, you've probably heard me talking loudly with everyone who will come near me <laughs> this weekend. Um, if you have a question, just call it out. If you have a comment, correction, addition, call it out. I want to, you guys know so much more than I do, and I want to, you know, I want this to be sort of a collective effort. Um, so yes, no need to raise hands. Um, all right, so sort of an overview of what I want to um, touch on, um, sort of an introduction to me, which mostly done. Um, kind of look at the previous missions. What have we already done with Jupiter? What do we know? Um, and that sets up the context for Juno, what are we trying to find out? Um, where it's at right now, what's coming up next, and then a little more look into the future. That is the uh, Jupiter family portrait taken by Voyager. Obviously the, the moons were not in that configuration, but I like that picture. Um, so this is me, this is the Phoebe Waterman House Public Observatory. That's the McDonald's, the uh, overpriced cafeteria <coughs> at the museum. So that's the American Indian. So this is 4th Street and Independence. We are out on the terrace. You do not have to go through security to get to us. You can just come straight off the sidewalk. A lot of people find that out the hard way. Um, this is our 16-inch Buller and Chivin Schmidt Cassegrain, which was given to us by Harvard. This is our main telescope. You can see we have a sun gun attached to it with a little projection of the sun here. Um, there's quite a few other telescopes that we use. Um, but most of what we do is daytime observing. So we're on the National Mall trying to put the telescopes where the people are. So we are open, um, it's not summer hours anymore, so we're open Wednesday through Sunday, noon to three. Most of the time we're looking at the sun. If the moon's up, we can see that. When Venus is not hiding behind the sun, we can look at that, um, and we'll use the big telescope for that. Um, those are our hours. Nighttime is kind of limited. We're, the museum's not open, we can't always get security late. But the next two Saturdays, we have nighttime observing. Um, at different times, check the website, um, but if any of you are around um, and you feel like you can maybe handle city skies after this gorgeousness we've been seeing, come on down and say hi or come say hi to us anytime during the day. I'm there Tuesday through Saturday. All right, so there are six previous missions that have visited Jupiter. Name them. Galileo. All right, Galileo. Voyager. Voyager. Pioneer, yep. Yeah, mission, not spacecraft, but missions. New Horizons flew by, yep. 
I did not think anyone was going to remember that one. That was going to be extra credit, right? Ulysses, and there's one more. Cassini. Cassini, yes. So we have six missions that have visited Jupiter. Um, of these, which one actually orbited? Galileo. Galileo. Everybody else was a flyby. And um, Cassini and New Horizons were obviously intended to study other things. They were using gravity assists. Um, Voyager and Pioneer were looking at um, Jupiter, among other things, but they were both flybys. So Juno is the first time since Galileo that we've actually gone into orbit around Jupiter and really gotten to study the system in depth. So I'm going to kind of look back on what, what the missions have done and what we've learned. So this is an artist's impression of Pioneer, so Pioneer 10 and 11. Um, Pioneer 10 launched in 1972, 11 followed in 1973. Once they knew that they could get through the asteroid belt and that that trajectory worked, they sent 11 after 10. Um, 11 was actually able to go about three times closer to Jupiter. Um, Pioneer 10 was really, that was really the test run to like, is this going to work? Oh, hey, it worked. Let's go. Um, so this, these were the first craft to pass through the asteroid belt. Uh, they were also the first craft to pass the orbit of Pluto. They have since been surpassed by Voyager, yes. So, but this was, this was huge, and this was the first reconnaissance mission just to get a sense of what was going on out there. Um, so these were the first flybys, first close-up observations of Jupiter and Saturn. So this is sort of an approach and uh, going back away uh, series from Pioneer 10. Can you guys over here see this? I realize I keep walking through your path. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> I'm going to pace around, as you notice. Um, so we've got this nice approach series. Can you tell camera technology's gotten better <laughs> in the last 40 years? Um, and then uh, we have this much closer view, because like I said, Pioneer 11 got three times closer, got this really lovely image of Jupiter. It's the first time we gotten to see this close up. So the science on board, direct imaging, obviously, measuring the atmosphere, measuring the radiation environment, cosmic rays, what's the solar wind like up there, um, and trying to detect uh, the magnetosphere of the planet. It found a whole lot of stuff. Um, among the most surprising was that there was a plasma sheet around the equator of Jupiter um, and that it has a magnetic field, massive magnetic field, 14 times stronger than Earth's, and that it does have a tail. It's stretched away from the suns just like Earth is. We also got images of three of the four Galilean moons. Which one did it not get? Volcanic one. Io, yep, so we got the other three, but we didn't get any pictures of Io. So between the two spacecraft, we got a really good sense of what was, you know, the overview of what was going on, got some pictures. Um, that set the stage for the next one, which was Voyager 1 and 2. Uh, these both launched in 1977, August and September. What was cool about the timing of the Voyager missions? The Grand Tour. So what does that mean? The planets were all in it. The four outer planets were in an alignment that only happens every 175 years. And somebody at NASA figured out in the 60s that this was coming up and maybe we should take advantage of it. Um, so Voyager 1 flew by Jupiter and Saturn on sort of an oblique angle. So then it got those two and then it went out of the solar system. Voyager 2 kind of stayed in the ecliptic plane and it flew by all four outer planets. So it's the only spacecraft to have visited Uranus and Neptune. Um, Blue by all four outer planets. Um, so the science data, it was building on what Pioneer had found, so m better measurements of the magnetosphere. Even though this only launched, you know, five, six years after Pioneer, the technologies had already gotten better for the instrument. So it was measuring, it was like, oh, hey, there's a plasma sheet. We should measure plasma waves. Um, solar wind's really interesting here. We got cosmic rays. So it, it added on to what we had learned and was making better measurements. I love this picture that it got of... Um, Io, Io shadows over here, and I believe it's Ganymede that's in front of it. I know that one's Io. I'm not going to lie about the second one because I don't know what it is. Um, found a whole lot of stuff. Remember how we'd never gotten images of Io before? Now we knew there were volcanoes, and we got the plumes and we got the textures. Um, we got detailed images of the planet and all of the moons. Got a much better sense of the radiation environment, which is. <laughs> many, many orders of magnitude more than what we experience here on Earth, um, and more details about the magnetic field. So this built on everything that we had found um, with Pioneer. So this is a big planet. It's got a lot going on, um, and we still don't understand why. We can't see very deep into it. So as we've kept going, we've been able to kind of probe deeper and deeper, but the, the clouds are still 
pretty good shrouds. So this is an animation of uh, Jupiter on the approach. This was from Voyager 1, and this was taken over the course of a month. So this was from 58 million miles away up to 31 million miles away. There's a lot going on there. You got, what's in the middle there? Really noticeable? Gray red spot? No, well, gray right now. But there's all these wind belts. There's stuff going different directions. Things are spinning. Things are shifting. The Earth has wind belts that go east and then west, depending on our latitude. Coriolis effect, spinning sphere. Lots of weird things happen. But Jupiter's big, it's got a thick atmosphere and it's spinning faster than the Earth. So there's, there's so much here. I just, I love this animation. All right, so next thing that we sent, um, roughly 20, you know, 15, 20 years later, was Galileo. And this is the one that went into orbit. So this was really devoted to studying the system of Jupiter. Um, this is Galileo being uh, deployed from the Atlantis uh, space shuttle. So this one was not sent on a rocket from the Earth. This was brought up by the shuttle and deployed by the astronauts. So it had to do five gravity assists to get it to Jupiter. Um, it was actually pretty cool. The um, launched in 1989 from the space shuttle. And it had to do, it had five gravity assists. So it started around Venus, swung by the Earth, went by uh, Gaspara, which was an asteroid. And my notes are very long. I want to make sure I get these in the right order. Did another Earth flyby, and then it flew by the asteroid Ida. What happened when it flew by Ida? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it found some. It found the first moon known around an asteroid, Dactyl. Yep. So even though it wasn't supposed to study that asteroid, we found our first asteroid moon. Um, yeah, so this is, this is pretty cool, even on the way there. So five gravity assists. It, so it had launched in 1989, and it got to Jupiter in 1995. Between 89 and 95, something cool happened on Jupiter. What was it? Shoemaker-Levy. And it was on the way there, right, first craft to orbit Jupiter. And it got to see, and it was actually out of perspective from Earth. We couldn't really directly see at least the first fragments of Shoemaker-Levy. But on its way there, Galileo got these great pictures of this thing smashing into Jupiter, making those flashes like he was just talking about. Um, so this was, this was a really nice bonus. We timed it pretty well. Um, so the science data, it was looking, and again, with the orbit where you're able to study something for a much longer period of time, see how it changes, um, it was able to get details on the moon. So this is ridges on Europa. That's a really complex surface. That's going to be fun to study. Um, and it, got, it was really looking at the clouds, the wind, the weather, all those wind belts you saw moving around. What's going on with those? How do they change? What are they made of? Um, so we found, Galileo found the ring system. With the perspective and the instruments that it had, we were able to find the ring system. It also found, uh, got better measurements of the composition of the atmosphere. It found thunderstorms with lightning. Um, and uh, I should mention the Galileo mission also, so it was an orbiter. It also had a probe that it dropped into Jupiter and for 58 minutes as this thing was falling, it was taking direct composition, wind, density, speed, all of that, all of those measurements, sending them up to the orbiter as fast as it could. The 58 minutes of data, a whole lot of really great direct uh, evidence there. And so it was finding these thunderstorms. It measured 450 mile per hour winds. We don't have that here, e not even on Mount Washington. <laughs> <laughs> And it also discovered the first evidence that some of the moons, um, Europa and Ganymede, um, might have water oceans underneath their crusts. So that's pretty cool. All right. Oh, I don't know exactly. I can look it up. Because part of, yeah, part of it was the pressure. Part of it was also just the heat as it went in. It did eventually, I think the antenna melted was what, cut it off from communicating. Um, but there, yeah, the, when you're going into a planet that's, that, that's got that much going on, yeah, I can, I can look up what pressure it was at. Uh, when it oh, I have a diagram that has that. <laughs> um, it, at, the ta at the surface, it's fairly cold because it's fairly far away from the sun. But as you go and you start getting the pressure, it increases. I will need to look at a diagram to see that. Oh, I don't know that either. <laughs> it's a great question, though, because I, I, I do want to look up 
a little more, more detail, because I mean, there, there was so much here. This is a tiny summary of the findings about the planet here from Galileo. One of the other things it found was these hot spots. These are places where the clouds thin and it's suddenly drier and warmer. And we don't know what that is. Is there's layer stuff going on? Maybe it's like the Earth's stratosphere, but they didn't know what was going on. They just found that they existed. All right, so Ulysses, which somebody knew about, which I'm impressed by. What was Ulysses actually supposed to study? Sun. And it didn't have any cameras on board, so we didn't get any pictures from it, which is probably part of why it's not talked about all that much with Jupiter. Launched fairly soon after Galileo. Um, it did, it was to study the sun from orbit. It did a gravity assist around Jupiter. Everybody uses Jupiter for a gravity assist. Can't imagine why. Uh, <laughs> so two years later, it does a slingshot which sent it, sent it in toward the sun. As it flew by, the thing that it was studying on the sun was magnetic fields, solar wind, high energy particles, radio and plasma waves. It wasn't taking pictures, it was doing all this electromag measurement. So it did a test run with the instruments when it ran around Jupiter, and what it gave us basically was some fine-tuned measurements of the magnetic field as it, as it zoomed around Jupiter. All right, and then Cassini-Huygens, which is still active. Uh, what was this one uh, sent to study? Sorry. Exactly, so another gravity assist. Um, so this one launched in 1997 um, and flew by Jupiter in 2000 for a gravity assist. Um, it was there, it had a lot of spectrometers, more plasma wave detectors, and it's Cassini-Huygens. Cassini is the orbiter, Huygens was the probe. That is the surface of Titan. That is an image from the Huygens probe. It fell through Titan's atmosphere, it landed, and uh, I forget how long it functioned for, but it got us a whole bunch of really great surface level data. Um, and it set up the, again, you know, the use, you know, it helped further our use of probes that we actually drop into stuff as opposed to just orbiting. Um, pros and cons to either. Um, but it dropped the Huygens probe and among the findings, um, it found a methane haze, when it flew by Jupiter, found a methane haze to Jupiter's poles, didn't exist at the equator, so we got some pole equator differences going on. Um, it found that the great red spot was high in methane and hotter than the stuff around it. And it got several beautiful pictures. This was the first full color, full globe portrait of Jupiter. And this is by Cassini. This is one of my favorite pictures. And again, I believe Europa is some, it's, one, it, it's somewhere in here and that is Europa's shadow passing over the planet. The size of the um, great spot, that changes this. It does, it does. For a long time, it was about three Earths in diameter. In recent um, months, they've noticed it shrunk down to about two Earth diameters. Now, it's, it's a storm. It's been, they've been seeing it in telescopes for at least 200 years, and they did, a, there weren't reported big changes in size. Now it seems to be shrinking rather noticeably. So that might, that's going to be a great thing for Juno to look at. What, why is it shrinking? What's changing in that storm as it shrinks? And that might help us figure out what was powering it to begin with. Yeah. So Cassini got us some real beautiful stuff. And then finally, New Horizons, most recent. What was that sent to study? Pluto. Yes. Um, but the Jupiter flyby was a big part of that. Again, gravity assist. Um, so they, they did actually make an image of New Horizons with Jupiter uh, for the flyby. So that one launched in 2006, just in time before Pluto was reclassified. Um, did the gravity assist from Jupiter only a year later, because it was booking it out of the solar system, 36,000 miles an hour. Um, so for about six months as it flew toward Jupiter and then away from it as it passed by, it was taking images and doing spectroscopy. I love this composite image. Th these were not taken at the same time, but it's um, with infrared and visible, it's Jupiter and Io with the little plume. And of course there is the beautiful plume. The uh, person speaking yesterday had the animation of it. I don't have that, but yeah. That Considering the size of that moon, that, that is a really high volcanic eruption. That's getting way off the surface. Um, so the Galileo mission, um, how did it end in 2003? They deorbited it specifically because they didn't want to contaminate these, they didn't want to crash into any of the moons. Found water ocean, there might be life. We do not want any hitchhiking microbes to mess that up. So they purposefully sent it into Jupiter's atmosphere to burn up. Uh, so since 2003, which was the end of the Galileo mission, 
when New Horizons flew by, it noted it had already noticed changes in the in the red spot in these other things. Um, in the ring system, we had always thought it was dust and particles. New Horizons, with its really good camera, it saw things the size of boulders floating around in there. So that you know, that's a consideration when you're flying a spacecraft through. Um, and it found high amounts of ammonia in the clouds on Jupiter. So. I have heard that. I've heard it some places that Galileo saw it. Considering how crappy his optics were, how good the optics are at my telescope, and the fact that I can't resolve the great red spot because it's in one of the bands, I find it hard to believe, but he spent a lot more time on it than I did. So there are conflicting reports as to whether he saw it and whether he would have had the resolution to see it. It obviously shows up better in infrared because there's a big temperature difference. So it is unresolved whether or not he actually saw it. We know the storm's at least 200 years old. It, it might have been larger back. That is entirely true. Exactly. So, old storm. Yeah. All right, so this is a lovely graphic that NASA made that is sort of an overview of the missions. And you'll notice, so well, of all the ways that we've looked at Jupiter. So it starts with Galileo. There's a drawing. You notice that line stops. All the ones that orbited it or went around it, go around, all the ones that were flybys continue. So we got Galileo here that stays around it. We got Juno that's staying around it. And of course we have the Hubble, which I didn't talk about, but the Hubble has made a lot of really great observations of Jupiter. I have at least one Hubble picture in here. So this is sort of the overview. Here's what, what we've sent and how it has looked every time. And then here's, here's where we're going. So we're at, we're at Juno here. And with all of these spacecrafts, there is, ah, no, go back. Yep, there we go. So, and of course this one's not gonna automatically start. So this is an infrared view from the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility, another entity that's looked at it. But with all of the spacecraft there, I talked about a lot of measurements, a lot of findings. So I wanna do kind of a rundown of sort of where, what do we know about Jupiter? because that'll be the context for what Juno's trying to find out. So pop quiz, Jupiter vital stats. What's the diameter? <laughs> yes. <laughs> About 11 times the Earth. About 11 Earths, yep, that's my favorite measurement, especially with visitors, because I throw big numbers and they go, huh? So I love this graphic that somebody did that is 11 little Earths, um, fading out over the great red spot, so you can see the comparison. So yeah, it's about 11 Earths in diameter. How about the mass? You're getting gold stars today, dude. <laughs> yep, it's about 318 nerds. Or, if you want to be specific, 10 to the 27th is an octillion. So it is 1.87 octillion kilograms or 4.19 octillion pounds. I prefer 310 Earths, much more understandable. How about its orbital distance from the sun? So the Earth is 93 million miles away. That's one AU. Well, 5.2 times 480. Yep, yep. All right, so yeah, we got, yeah, 5.2 AU. So that's, um, oh, that might be kilometers. I might've gotten my, I think that's kilometers. I got my units mixed up. Eh, sorry, don't tell the Smithsonian. All right, orbital period. Orbital period. Yep, just about 12 years. Yep, 11.86. Rotation period? Yep. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah 9.925. So um, almost 10 hours. So that's fast. That's, and for something that's 11 times the diameter of the Earth, spinning at less than half the time of our day, that's, that's a lot of movement. It's a lot of angular momentum. How many moons? Yep, yep, 60. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's 50 that are completely confirmed. There's 17 more that are awaiting confirmation. So the number I see that seems to be generally accepted is there are 67 natural satellites. Right, well, I, and I, I mean, Galileo orbited it for a long time and it, and it, found, it found a few more, but it, it, you know, we haven't, with these other two recent flybys with real good cameras, we haven't found any new ones recently. So well, maybe we've got them all, who knows? Uh, which one's the largest moon? Ganymede, also the largest moon in the solar system. 
and super extra credit, you have to wait five seconds. <laughs> What's the orbital period of IO? Yep, 42.45 hours, yep. So that's when you're, looking, when you're looking at Jupiter, the one that's zipping around, that'll sometimes switch places with Europa if you watch for a couple hours, that's Io. So of the Galilean moons, that's the one going the fastest, moves the most. Awesome job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know, obviously. You're giving him his moment of glory. You're so nice. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. All right, so... So more about what we know about Jupiter. So it's basic composition, it's mostly hydrogen, some helium, 1% other. What does that composition remind you of? Sun. Stars and the sun, yeah. So that is part of the reason that we think Jupiter formed really early on in the solar system. The sun was forming, we think Jupiter formed first because there was a lot of those light elements, hydrogen and helium. As the young sun got going and started doing fusion and really blasting stuff away, the lighter materials would have been blown away and you would have been left with things more like the composition of Earth and the terrestrial planets where you've got more of those heavier elements. So that's part of why we think Jupiter is going to be such a great window into how the solar system formed. Because much like the chondrules in a meteorite, it's this, and it's this time capsule of what things looked like at that time. Yes? I am not sure. There are, there are red dwarf stars that are not much bigger than, I mean, Proxima Centauri is, is not that much bigger in diameter or mass than Jupiter. So for the circumstances, you know, it, it gets talked about a lot as a failed star, Jupiter does. And so the exact, I would have to ask my coworker Genevieve about the exact cutoff for that, but it's not much. It's really not much. Okay, just much more dense, okay. Yeah, because in size, it's pretty comparable. Yeah, the mass is very different, yeah. Cool. So what we know of the structure, based on all these flybys and everything, we know we've got these cloud layers, sort of, you know, the pressure goes up. So at 620 miles or 1,000 kilometers deep, the pressure's 5,000 bars. So that'll squish you. So we got clouds. We think, so there's some hydrogen and helium layers in here. We think this blue area is liquid metallic hydrogen under so much pressure that it conducts like a metal. And it is in that first column of the periodic table. So supposedly under the right conditions, it should behave like some of the rare earth metals. And then there's a core and you'll notice there is a question mark there. Maybe it has one, maybe we don't know. Hey, look at that. So technically it shouldn't be on the what we know slide, but you know. So we've got clouds and atmosphere, liquid metallic, and then some sort of core, maybe size density unknown. Um, it has a lot of wind and weather. With that quick spin, 10 hours, you get massive jet streams, and you end up with those wind belts that we saw in the, in the animation from Voyager. Um, you get storms, great red spot, lots and lots of others. Get those hot spots we talked about, dry, thin clouds, different temperature. There's so much going on in the wind and weather. We've noticed what's happened when we've been there. But again, Galileo, it's been 13 years since that spacecraft ended and we haven't been able to get a close-up constant view. Less water. So there is water. Um, we don't know how much. Um, the clouds generally are ammonia, um, but ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, yum. Um, but there, yeah, there are places where the clouds seem to thin and, and we can see deeper into the more transparent atmosphere. Um, but why that is, how long they last, all of that is still um, to be determined. Well, doesn't that depend? There is convection mm -hmm. because there is heating from the core. Exactly. And once you have convection, so that's where you got that spot. With that rate, you have to have things like cumulus. Mm -hmm. Right. Cumulus. Yeah. Exactly. So there yeah. Are some an analogies with yes. The yes. That have been constructed because they could test the models that they used on the Earth and extend the mathematics mm -hmm. the gravity and the speed of Jupiter. Right. And, and the different the chemical composition. Yeah. yeah exactly. No, there, and that's, that's really huge because the way that we've understood places like Io and other planets is using our knowledge of Earth geology. Because with the exception of Curiosity, we don't have any robotic geologists anywhere else. Yeah, 
So that's, that's an excellent point. So we know it's got a ring system. It's got several concentric sections, mostly dust. But like I said, we found um, Cassini, I think, noticed that there were boulders in the rings too. Um, it has a magnetosphere. It's massive. Like I said, it's 14 times stronger than the Earth's. And if the magnetosphere was visible from Earth, Jupiter's magnetosphere would look twice the diameter of the full moon. Yeah, it encompasses all the Galilean moons. It's freaking massive. So it's probably from that liquid metallic hydrogen core mantle layer thing, but that might depend on how that rotates relative to the surface, which we have yet to determine. Um, it's super strong. Again, it's got that magnetic tail pushed away from the sun by the solar wind. Um, the plasma sheet is created. So IO, volcanoes, it's spitting out sulfur dioxide. The massive magnetic field then ionizes that sulfur dioxide. So IO is twiddling around and it's basically leaving a torus of fart in its, in its orbit. That's what it is. So, so you've got this, this gas, which the magnetic field is then ionizing. So now you've got this plasma sheet that mixes with hydrogen also coming off the planet and that adds to um, the massive radiation belt around Jupiter. Um, so it's partially the plasma sheet and there's something else going on because even that doesn't account for the strength of radiation that all these flybys have measured. Um, in the Jupiter orbited insertion video that Juno put out, they had said in measurements, I, I cannot remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, on Earth, we experienced maybe a quarter of a rad, and when they got to Jupiter, they were looking at 200 million rad. So, what the heck, dude? We're gonna find out, we hope. Yeah, yeah. So, this is, this is a massive planet with a whole lot of electromagnetic radiation stuff going on, and we had to design a spacecraft that could survive all of that. So, both the spacecraft and the orbital plan had to take that into account, because you don't really want to get killed by the thing you're trying to study. Um, it also has really powerful aurorae. That plasma sheet and solar wind get pulled into that super strong magnetic field. Next page, this is a Hubble picture, uh, fairly recent, that was from earlier this year, that shows the aurorae on the North Pole there. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to point out about what we know about Jupiter, obviously there's a lot, this is kind of trying to focus, um, is its role in the solar system. So because it formed early, it's got that original composition. It's hopefully going to tell us about not only its formation, but the whole solar system. How do planetary systems form? How do stars relate to the planets as they are forming? How do they change? So um, picture, um, I believe it is color enhanced. Um, I think it's a yeah, yeah, it's probably a composite. Yeah. You're all astrophotographers, you know how this goes. The raw image looks like, huh? <laughs> and then you get this, you're like, ah, now I can see things. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's UV for the, for the aurorae, and then there's some infrared for the surface, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you got the whole electromagnetic spectrum, you might as well look at the whole thing, put it all in your picture. Um, how many people have seen the article about Jupiter migrating in toward the sun and having a whole bunch of different orbital distances? Yeah, so based on gravitational modeling and lots and lots of math, looking at the asteroid belt, looking at the orbits of the other planets, we think that Jupiter, early on, it formed, Saturn had formed soon after it, and the two of them wandered in, they got much closer to the sun, and with help from each other's gravity, rather than plunging into the sun, they seem to have helped pull each other back out to the orbits they are now stably in. And they've, the evidence they've seen has to do with the placement and thickness of the asteroid belt and the spacing of the other planet's orbits. I can't remember anything else from the article about the specifics of how they figured that out, but they think that Jupiter's movement like that allowed the Earth and other planets to form and not end up getting bombarded by the asteroid belt. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So. It's had a big, it has, it's the most gravitationally dominant thing other than the sun. It plays a literally big role in the solar system. Um, and it does already, and it also gravitationally influences things. You know, all of the planets and the sun pulls on them. So it's going to, it's important to study this thing because it is the the sun. No, shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so. That was a review of what we do know. What don't we know? A lot. Um, so we don't really, you know, it's been very vague how and when it formed. Um, 
the core and interior, what's going on in there. We haven't yet sent something that's got gravity measurements that can, that can orbit the planet and can make more precise measurements to help us figure out the mass profile of the interior. Um, the cycles and driving forces in the atmosphere. You know, Galileo got some stuff, but we've got much better measurements now. Um, the relationship of the atmosphere and the interior. What's going on out here and how is, how is the interior different? Related to that, um, variations equator to poles. Um, both so Galileo was orbiting roughly in the plane because it wanted to also be able to see the moons. We haven't really gotten to see the poles. Juno has an orbit that lets us see the poles. So that's pretty cool. Um, what the heck generates that freaking huge magnetic field? Maybe it's the liquid hydrogen layer, but maybe that isn't there. Maybe it's something else. Um, what powers the auroras? We know, again, pieces of it, but really what, what's the physical process that allows it to happen the way it does? Um, sources and mechanisms for the radiation belts. Again, you know, the plasma sheet has to do with it, but again, doesn't explain 200 million rad. Um, this is a big one, again, for the relationship of atmosphere and interior. How does the interior rotate? Is it doing kind of what the sun's doing, where the core and the outer layers are not in sync at all, and that shearing and differential spin causes all these other things we're seeing? And a lot more. But I chose this list because this is a lot of the stuff that Juno is looking to answer. So with the background, here we have Galileo, the first orbiter mission since Gal Juno, first orbiter since Galileo. I have a model. This is, we figured out it's roughly a 150th scale because <laughs> the real spacecraft is enormous. I'm going to pass this around so you all can take a look at it. So maybe do front row and back and just kind of take it back. Um, so this is a big spinning triangle. It launched in 2011, took five years to get to Jupiter, and it did an Earth flyby for once. It did something going to Jupiter, did a gravity assist around the Earth. Look at that. Um, if you missed the press conference about the flyby, that's because it was in October of 2013 during the government shutdown. I was at home cursing my government, not allowed to go to work, and there was no live stream from NASA. My cat was wondering why I was so mad. Um, but it did get pictures. I, the, the few people that were not furloughed at NASA were running the maneuvers for this flyby and then later got to process the data. Um, the mythology connections. So, um, who was Jupiter in mythology? King of the gods in the Roman. Yep, he's the equivalent of Zeus for the Greeks. Um, and Jupiter's moons, the names of the moons of the planet. What, what's the convention for naming the moons? Yep, lovers, daughters, and conquests, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> of, of Jupiter. And there's enough to name 67 of them, and I'm sure there's more. Um, who was Juno? His wife. So Jupiter's chilling out there with a whole lot of lovers swirling around him. And NASA sent his wife to go check up on him. Wow. Never say NASA doesn't have a sense of humor. Now their official explanation for the name of Juno is that uh, Jupiter the god um, en enshrouded himself in clouds to hide his mischief and only Juno was able to peer below the clouds to see what was going on. So the idea is that the Juno spacecraft will be able to see below the clouds and see what's going on. They said not to look for misbehavior. Like, I don't know, that radiation belt sounds like misbehavior to me. But uh, yeah, so there's a cool mythology connection there. Um, and these are the mission objectives. So how did Jupiter form? How much water is there? There's, we got some composition sense, but how much of it is water? What's the interior structure? Is there a core? What's the density? What's the size? Does it rotate like a solid? Is the interior in sync with the exterior? Um, process of the power of the auroras, what generates the magnetic field? How's the atmosphere related to the interior, radiation belt, all that. So everything we had talked about, this is what the mission wants to, to find. The way to remember uh, the mission objectives is OIM, origin, interior, atmosphere, magnetosphere, OIM. So if somebody asks you what the Juno mission is all about, we are looking for its origin in the solar systems, its interior, atmosphere and processes, magnetosphere and related processes, OIM. So this is thanks to Skip. Uh, I don't know how many of you read XKCD. When Juno orbital insertion happened on July 4th, not too long ago, it was within one second of the um, intended time. 
Now, when you're moving at thousands of miles per second, it's, well, hundreds of miles per second, it, that's still quite a, a ways, but within one second. So, uh, of course, XKCD brilliance here. After traveling 1.7 billion miles, the Juno spacecraft reached Jupiter within one second of its scheduled arrival time. Very impressive, thank you. I mean, we were aiming for Saturn, but still, nailed the time, shh. <laughs> so no, we were aiming for Jupiter, we nailed that. Um, one other cool bit of randomness that I decided to add here. This happened on the 240th birthday of the United States, July 4th. The symbol for Jupiter is a stylized 24. Get out the tin hats, I don't know. <laughs> so that was something that my coworker noticed that we thought was pretty cool. I am not sure. It, according to what I looked up, um, it's supposed to be either um, Jupiter's lightning bolt, or um, I think there was one that said it's. I, I don't know why. I could not find anything on why it's. Right. 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 Uh, the principal investigator is Scott Bolton of Southwest Research Institute. Um, he's based in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, the project scientist is Steve Levin of NASA JPL down at Caltech. Uh, the spacecraft was built by Lockheed Martin at their location in Denver, Colorado. Um, and the mission is managed by JPL um, at Caltech in Pasadena. Um, and it's part of the New Frontiers program, which includes New Horizons, OSIRIS-REx, and Juno. Who can tell me when OSIRIS-REx is launching? Thursday. This Thursday, the 8th. So keep an eye out. What's OSIRIS-REx gonna do? It's gonna bring the geologists a piece of an asteroid. I am so excited. <laughs> Cause yeah, so it's, it's gonna go, it's gonna go orbit, um, what is it? Yeah, Bennu, and it's gonna return like a big chunk of rock from an asteroid that we will get to study. So. The orbiters are great, spectroscopy is great. Real pieces of rock make me so happy. Everyone who's on the geology hike knows that. Um, so it's part of this new frontiers program that is breaking a lot of boundaries. So this is, um, so the new frontiers is managed out of NASA Marshall in Huntsville. But this is, this is your, obviously there's thousands of people involved in doing a mission like this, but here's your top guys. All right, so 40 minutes in, I finally get to like the basics here. So the spacecraft, as you've seen on the model, it's a big triangle. It is spinning. Spinning is for stabilization. And it also means that the instruments that are here, they did not have to build in any mechanism that they point the instruments. The instruments are just fixed and it spins and the planet rotates under it and the, and the instruments just pan over. So they basically like a scanner, just get their measurements of the planet. It is 66 feet in wingspan, that basically is a basketball court plus a little bit of, plus an arm sticking out into the stands. Each of those solar arrays is 30 feet long and it is solar powered. This is the farthest we've ever sent anything solar powered. Like we said, about 5.2 AU, that's 25 times less sunlight than we get on Earth. The way they made this work is for one thing, instruments are a lot more energy efficient, so they've really dropped the power requirements of the spacecraft. They made huge solar arrays, 650 square feet of solar array on this thing. And they've designed the orbits and the mission so it's basically never not in the sun. The longest it was in shadow was during the Earth flyby and they had to prep for that for a month. Um, so it spins and it's got a whole lot of instruments. So, and this is great, I can actually show it on this rather than trying to point to the thing. So the front part here is the gravity measurement, that's, gonna, that's how we're going to get mass information and get at the interior. Um, this part under here, the main part of the spacecraft, which is 11 and a half by 11 and a half feet, this is a titanium vault with one inch thick walls. Because we're sending a lot of sensitive electronics into a 200 million rad environment. We would like to not fry them on the first run. And we did already do orbital insertion. They are not fried, they're working. But the vault contains a whole lot of stuff. So the magnetometer is the funky thing on the end here. So as it spins, it's going to get mag magnetic field measurements. Got the gravity science. Pretty much everything else is in the vault. So we have a microwave radiometer. Uh, we have electric field detectors. Um, we have the 
yeah, plasma, plasma wave detector called WAVES. Uh, particle detector, so it is the Jupiter Energetic Particle Detector Instrument, JEDI. Love that name. I love how NASA does acronyms. And Alan Stern did verify that they spend way more time than they should with a dictionary trying to make really cool acronyms. Because uh, when you read some of these, you read the name of the actual spacecraft, like that makes no sense, but it's a really cool acronym. Um, so it's got a UV spectrograph, it's got an infrared auroral mapper, and of course it has JunoCam, which is where most of the stuff that we're going to see, um, certainly the things that have already been sent back are from JunoCam. So that is a color camera, um, but the UV and IR are also going to contribute to the data that it's getting. So the brains and everything is in here under one inch thick walls of titanium. Um, gravity, magnetometer, solar arrays. So it's and it's spinning it spins. It spins this way. So it keeps, if that's the sun, it's here. And as it does the orbits of Jupiter, the instruments on the side here, just as it spins, it'll get a pan of the planet. It was spinning at about 5 RPM during the orbital insertion for stability. For the science passes, it's doing 2 RPM. So it's, and even during the cruise, it was spinning the whole time. So it stays facing the sun. It, it was pretty ingenious how they had to design the orbit of this thing. Uh, yes, it's in polar orbit. Um, and I think it's we're running out of material for radio radioactive yeah for the radio generators, um, and it was and it was going to be heavy. I mean, 650 square feet of solar panels also kind of heavy, but the. They were, I think part of it was they were trying to prove that you can do solar power at this level because some other future missions that are going to go farther out are planning to use solar power. Um, so this was, uh, this is people for scale. This is it in the clean room. So that's just the magnetometer. That's just that part. And that's taller than that person. So. Huh? It is. Yeah, totally. Yep. So there's, there's the central vault. So it launched and it separated, it was all folded up and then it unfolded itself and then it started spinning. So the solar panels are the Yes, three exactly. So the solar panels are these three. So each of these basically is, each of these are four panels. This one is three plus the magnetometer. So you got 11 solar arrays here. Yep. So those unfolded themselves after they fit inside their, their launch vehicle and off it went. Um, it's capable of 400 kilowatt hours, I believe. Um, that's what I was reading earlier. Yeah. So this is an animation uh, from its approach. So like I said, it, it got to Jupiter orbit July 4th. So this is um, from June. This is a two-day time lapse. I've labeled the four moons. I'm going to see if this works. There we go. This is two days from JunoCam. So obviously it's not a video, it's a time lapse of images because the thing's spinning. But there go the moons. And if you go back to your Jupiter Moons app, if anybody else has that Sky and Telescope app, which I love, it's totally worth the four bucks, um, you can go back to that date and that's pretty much what the moons look like. Yeah. All right, so the orbit. So now I, can, I keep talking about polar orbit, I can finally explain it a little bit. So it arrived July 4th. So it was coming in here. It's in a very eccentric polar orbit. Why would we do that? So, so yeah, for one, to keep it in the sun. Keep it out of the radiation. You got it. If we're, because the radiation is, is strongest around the equator. If we were orbiting here that close, <laughs> unhappy electronics. So it goes in over the, the other reason too is that nothing else had ever done a polar orbit. We've never gotten direct views of the poles. So it came in from above and it zoomed through. That was July 4th. That was, the, that was the within one second, like we had to make that or the whole mission was dead. So it zoomed in and then it went into, so it started, got itself in and it did these two capture orbits. So these are 54, well 53 and a half long, uh, 53 and a half day orbits. Um, so it was here July 4th, tootled around, it was here again a week ago, August 27th. So the pictures that I have to show you that NASA released uh, a couple of them while we've been up here um, are from that August 27th close pass. So it's doing one more capture orbit. It's gonna fly by close again on October 14th. 
and then they will do the maneuver to drop it into these 14-day science orbits. So again, it's going to zoom in from the North Pole to the South Pole. As the planet spins underneath it and the instruments pan, they'll be able to get pole-to-pole -pole mapping. They've designed the timing of the 14 days so they'll be able to get the entire planet multiple times over the year and a bit that the mission is active. Um, but again, it, it zooms in here and then it goes way out to get outside that radiation belt so it can kind of recover and send stuff and then come back in. All right. Yep, so we've got the two capture orbits, we've got our close passes, so we're coming up on the next close pass. And again, the, the images and stuff on, Octo on August 27th, like when they did orbital insertion, when it first came in, all the instruments were off. Because this was, this was going to be so precise and tough. It was just like, we don't need any variables. Just get the thing into orbit. Then we'll worry about it. Um, August 27th was the first pass where the eyes were open. All the instruments were on. So we've got these JunoCam images. And we've got, they have some preliminary uh, measurements. All the other radiation, magnetic, all that stuff, they're going to need to process. It will probably come out in the form of papers later on. Um, images are easier to process and release quickly. Um, next stage, it'll do these 34 14-day science orbits. Um, so that's five days after that close pass. They'll do the fire the rockets to get it into the orbit. Then it'll start doing that. Um, so that's going to continue until February 20th, 2018. So that will be when Juno will have the same fate as Galileo. So I'm going to send it in. Because, once again, we do not want to contaminate the moons that we'd like to go look for life on. Yeah. All right. So there's what it's going to do. Let's see what it's done. So this is from the approach to that first close pass, so that first capture orbit. It's coming in from 54 days. The one on the left is a true color image from the Juno cam. So we're coming in from the side. We've got the sunny side. Great red spot was right there. Nicely done, guys. This one is an image through the infrared filter. Notice what's the hottest in the infrared. Yeah, look at that. So this kind of data is going to help us, again, look at those minutia in the atmosphere, those processes, the weather, the winds, all of that stuff. This one, this is a beauty. And it's, it's a little washed out here in the, on the screen. Um, this is during the close pass. So this is as it was coming in over the North Pole. And this, this August 27th, this is the closest it's ever going to get. It was 2,600 miles off cloud tops. For a planet that size, if it was a basketball, it would be a third of an inch off of it. So real close. But we've never seen the poles like this. So the scientists are looking at, OK, yeah, this is, this is weird. So this is bluer. And that's real color. It's bluer up here. There's lots of these little storms and circles. The wind belts are going, and the storms are going both, some are counterclockwise, some are clockwise. OK. And we got the bands. We're all familiar with the bands in the atmosphere near the equator. We don't get any of that up here. The cloud structures, the wind belts, the storms are extremely different up here at the pole than they are over here. We've studied this pretty well. Still a lot we need to learn. But the poles are a pretty different animal. So <laughs> I think it, it's, it's probably somewhere around here up. Because again, even then when we were seeing this, we're s it's getting foreshortened because it's curving away. So it, the cutoff, it, it, it's somewhere around where the color changes because they've really never seen that blue color before. So that's the North Pole. Here's the South Pole. So which, blue yep, blue color, similar. So, but... Other, other things have passed, like vo the Voyager 1 kind of went up and over the North Pole, so we got a little bit, not as good a camera. But again, all these little storms, the blue color, the wind belts and directions, the, the banding that isn't present at all. So there's clearly very different stuff going on at the poles than there is at the equator. Maybe that has to do with the magnetic field orientation. Maybe it has to do with the spin speed. Maybe it has to do with the radiation. It's probably a combination of those plus several other things we haven't thought of yet. Yeah. We are looking straight down the south, south, south geographic pole is basically here. Yeah. 
So we're looking straight down on it. This is about an hour after the closest pass, so it's on its way out from that close pass. These, are, these were released three days ago. So this is the kind of stuff we're gonna start getting. And NASA's been really great about describing in the captions what, what this means, what do we see? In this case, it's all these things we've never seen before. Let's, uh, Scott Bolton's very good at intelligently saying we have no clue what's going on here. Because um, you have to, if you're at NASA, you gotta get good at saying we don't know. Um, It does. It does. And you get the hexagon. Yeah, it breaks down in a different way. It's <laughs> not unreasonable. Right. That for similar gases, right. you'd have blues and band structure. Exactly. That tell you what you get. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Especially when the cyclones go in opposite directions. Exactly. Yeah. The, the count clockwise, counterclockwise, not with a discernible pattern. What? Yeah. And I mean, Saturn's smaller, but it's still pretty big. And it's got a fairly similar spin rate. So. It's, it, it doesn't have quite as much thickness. The jet streams are probably different, but yeah, there, there are similarities and differences there. And again, that, that co comparative planetology is an amazing thing. Yeah. So that is the newest image. Um, so now what's next? So we've got these 14-day science orbits. Um, if NASA follows the pattern that they have with their excellent publications, uh, publici publici publicization of what they're doing, They'll be doing image releases fairly soon after each of the science orbits. Um, so starting October 19th, we'll be into that 14-day cycle. Um, they are posting raw images, and they are encouraging amateur photographer, astrophotographers to process them. So if you go to the Juno, uh, Juno Image Gallery, you can pull stuff up, and I know a lot of you photographers play with the Juno data. It's awesome. Um, so they are posting the raw stuff as well as the pretty process stuff. Um, <laughs> if you have any idea how many visit drives I have seen run into stuff doing that stupid game, oh my god. Oh. It, it'll happen. Oh, I know. Oh, there's going to be so many good memes and Photoshop jobs on this. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah. So it, yeah, yeah, this is what happens when you crowdsource. Weird stuff. Um, so yeah, the magnetosphere and radiation data, which is going to answer a lot more of the questions that we had talked about, that's going to come later. It'll be processed, it'll be in papers, but it's coming. Um, you can follow it if you are a Twitter person. I am, I realize not many people are probably here, uh, but it's at NASA Juno. The mission website, I mean, you can go to NASA and it's one of the featured missions, but it's mission pages slash Juno. Um, the other thing that's next is a Europa mission. So it is, we don't have a launch date for it yet. They have selected the instruments. The body of it looks kind of similar to Juno. We got gravity, we got spectrometers and plasma waves and all sorts of stuff there. Um, it's, gonna do, it's gonna be orbiting Jupiter, but it's gonna do repeated flybys. They're planning 45 orbit passes of Europa. Originally, they wanted to land and drill because what we really wanna do is poke a hold of that ocean and find out if there's anything alive in there but you don't get to map the whole thing if you're landed on it. So what they figured out is if they have orbits that pass low enough, it can fly through some of the plumes of water and get a sample that way. So we're gonna see how that goes. You will notice what's powering it? Solar. So Juno is part of the research in how well does this work this far away from the sun, how well does the efficiency work, but this is also gonna be a solar powered mission. Uh, right now it's just Europa mission. Um, like I said, so we've got, the, we've got instruments, we've got sort of an orbital plan. Um, I don't know if they will change the name, um, but more things clearly need to come together for a launch date and specifics, but it, it has gotten funding and it is happening. So as much as we can say a NASA mission is happening this far out. So just to get a good idea, the, the planet is rotating mm -hmm. and it's going to be this north mm -hmm. south, so we'll get different views. Yes, as yes. As it will cover the entire thing multiple times. I don't remember how many, but with a 10 hour spin, and it takes, you know, it's, it's a couple hours to do that, that close part with it spinning. So it, you, you'll get a good chunk of the planet each time and the 34 orbits. So yeah, we're gonna get really nice coverage and we'll get, you get that same section multiple times. Oh, hey, that's moved. Oh, hey, that's different. So we'll get, we'll get some evolution as well as full coverage, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is it looking at the pole to pole, deep crater, deep crater, it's time, or is it focused 
in a smaller area? What's the... It, it's going to depend. Um, the, yeah, the attitude and where it is um, d differs. Some of the passes are better for the gravity um, experiments. Some of them are better for the spectrometers and imagers. Um, so for the camera, yeah. Uh, you know, if it's panning as the planet's spin, you're actually going to get... Yeah, it'll be, they'll be sort of diagonal stripes. stripes. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Why did they pick 28 um, It's yeah. They don't. We don't need pictures. It's to keep people invested. And you you look at New Horizons. You look at how brilliantly they kept people involved. Because in the same way, the images were not the most. I mean, seeing some for the geologists. Yeah, the images are really important. But they're not going to tell it. He said it yesterday. They're not going to tell us as much as the spectrometry and all of these other measurements. But that's what people see. That's what gets shared on Facebook. That's what get keeps people invested in what NASA's doing and reminds them that, yeah, we don't have a shuttle program. We're not doing those kinds of human missions right now, but we're doing all this other really important stuff. And when you can share images, that's what people can relate to. So the JunoCam is there mostly to be able to engage the non-science research community. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So we're not even, yeah, we're not sure it'll last all 34 orbits. I'm not sure. It will probably be um, thruster fuel and funding. Um, those are often the determining factors in the life of a mission. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I'm sure they've left open that possibility. Pretty much every NASA mission, you've got your primary, your secondary, and if you're, and if you're you know, spirit and opportunity, or opportunity at this point, you're on your like sex tertiary. I don't know what the word is, but it's you know, 12 freaking years. So yeah, so I'm sure they have some backup plans um, and maybe they'll be more fuel efficient than they thought, but I, I hope that we'll get to extend it. I hope that vault's gonna hold. I hope the electronics are gonna last. But yeah, it's, it is always that variable. So hopefully, yeah. Right? <laughs> they, they might. They might. We did a Kickstarter to restore Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. So it, it is not beyond a government agency to do a Kickstarter to do something big. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this is one of my favorite pictures from Cassini. Um, I want to make sure that I actually respect the time and end. But um, I'm in DC at the observatory. You all have an open invitation. Anytime you're in DC, come visit. That's my email address. I have business cards for both me and the observatory. I have handy dandy fact sheets about Juno. These were printed a little while ago, so the actual orbital mechanics and some other things have changed <coughs> since these came out. Um, but those are, you can take any of those, but yes, please come visit at the observatory. Please be in touch. Um, other questions? You guys have been great about calling them out. I don't know. It's certainly possible. Sure. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So that yeah, that's probably right off the Juno main mission site. Excellent. That's great. That's probably part of why they're posting the raw images too. It's on the second uh, orbit. Yeah, it's in the second capture orbit right now. October 19th is when they do the maneuver that, that cuts it into that shorter orbit. And they chose 14 days because that's the time needed to get at with the planet's spin rate and the spacecraft to, to map the whole thing several times. Yeah. Do you know if the orbit is assigned to passively plug the blue at that date in case everything goes down? I don't think so. I don't think it's already programmed. Um, but I don't know that. 
they, they might have it set and be able to say, never mind, we want to stay longer. I'm not sure how they do that. Yeah. Yeah, it has a giant high gain antenna. Oh, come on. They do not have it labeled on here. Oh, actually, you know what? It is this because the high, yeah, this is the high gain antenna. The gravity of science is underneath it. The high gain antenna is part of the radiation shield. It's actually, it's what's protecting the gravity science thing. Right, yeah. So that's because the solar panels and that are always pointed towards sun slash earth. They can be in contact, yep. Probably. Right. Yeah. I hope. I hope there are a number of spacecraft that have gotten data as they've as they've gone in. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, the Grail the Grail spacecraft gave us information based on uh, they gave us the information of how much fuel they had left based on when they crashed. <laughs> so sometimes the crash itself can give you something, but yeah, you're right, the transmission becomes the issue. Yeah. yeah I don't know if any characters, but there are, there are, and it's, yeah, it's not, um, yeah, so on, on the side, on the, the facing away side, um, there are three figures, which are, it's Galileo, um, Juno and Jupiter. Yeah, they are little Lego figurines. Those are on the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, but no, it's, you, you can find it on the Juno mission page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Symbolism. Symbolism. Again, public engagement, it, you know, it's, it's part of how you have to get the public to care about what you're doing before they will care for it and fund it. You guys are awesome. <laughs> if anybody's left at 6.30, I'll be talking.